From Zeldathon to games done quick, using video games to raise money for charity has become a common practice in recent years, and fighting games are no exception. Take Transitional Combat, for example, an online Street Fighter V event created by Amanda Stevens that went on to raise over $10,000 for Trans Lifeline. Recently, I had the chance to speak with Amanda about her career in esports, as well as what inspired this initiative. So I went to school for journalism. I'm a traditionally trained journalist. And when I got out of school, like a lot of people who get out of college and have, you know, those more liberal arts degrees, I worked a retail job. <laughs> and at some point I said to myself, like, this is kind of whack. I spent like a, a metric F ton of money to be a classically trained journalist to not journalism. And around the same time, a friend of mine had reached out to me and was like, hey, I'm helping run this website called Girl Gamer Vogue. It was started by a bunch of people that knew each other through, I guess like Kotaku used to have like forums. And so like it was a bunch of women that had known each other through that. And so it was like a website about like gaming, geekery and fashion and like all the intersections. And it was like a women run written for a website. Eventually that site folded and I started writing for a site with sort of a similar mission statement called She Attack. And it was around then that I really gotten bitten by the League of Legends bug. And I was writing guides on like how to look at stuff that was happening in pro play and translate it to like your casual scrub. Eventually that got me noticed by some of the editors for different esports websites at the time. They were like, wow, you're like kind of, you like know what you're doing and you write really, really well because a lot of people, and this is still kind of true, esports media isn't filled to the brim, right? With people who went to school for journalism or writing. It's a lot of the times fans of games who just happen to write good, right? And so for me, it was, well, I'm good at gaming and I'm okay at this writing thing. So I've been told. So why not like actually do what I went to school for? And then the whole time I was writing about League of Legends, I was like, websites, like, yo, let me let me talk about this FGC shit. Yo, have you seen Marvel 3 though? Yo, you gotta, you gotta let me talk about this fighting game stuff. And they'd be like, nah, nobody in the FGC can read. And I was like, that might be true, but like this fighting game thing, trust me. And eventually I convinced a website that I was running, I was uh, their content editor for, for a little bit. I convinced them to like, let me apply for a press pass for Evo uh, in 2016. Amanda would continue her efforts in esports, both for various outlets, as well as her own projects, including The Neutral. While she had hoped to expand on these moving forward, current circumstances would delay those plans. With the global pandemic shifting daily life as we know it, and with massive protests forcing many to question their stances and perspectives towards race, 2020 has been a year unlike many others. As the fighting game community continues to find its way in this new world, Amanda would find an opportunity to do some good. So what Transitional Combat was, was a Street Fighter V tournament that I ran both for the East Coast and the West Coast because Street Fighter V ain't got that good net code. I wasn't feeling like doing the neutral, but I wanted to do something while everybody was feeling away about the death of George Floyd and all the protests going on. And I'm lucky and blessed in a sense that I am a very visible black person to an extent in the FGC, right? And I posited on Twitter, if I wanted to do a fighting game tournament for charity for Trans Lifeline, like would anybody wanna help? And you, you as a content creator probably know this too, is that sometimes you make those tweets and like it gets like five likes, couple retweets, but nobody's offering. And you're like, all right, cool. Maybe I need to put this on the back burner until I can dedicate all my energy to this. Instead, what happened with that tweet is, you know, I had people like Logan saying they want to help. I had people like, you know, NYC Furby saying he wanted to help, you know, Saban. I had all of these people being like, yo, what do you need? Like you need commentators, I'll commentate for free. You need someone to host the stream, I'll host the stream. And I was like, ah, oh, well, fuck. I was not expecting 40% of the FGC to reply to this uh, tweet. Gu guess I gotta run a tournament now. Luckily, Sermi from Maturino, Sabin, and Bunch, they were some of the earliest people to be like, yo, bet, what do you need? And so I was like, all right, I've run Magic tournaments before. I've run, you know, broadcasts for League of Legends. 
I, so I know the basics of like tournament organization and stream management. I know shit about fighting game tournament though. Tell me what I, what y'all need to run a fighting game tournament. And so in like three days, we had the date of the tournament, the name of the tournament, our commentary team, and like we cut a promo in like three days. I'm really blessed. Like we raised ten thousand two hundred like forty something dollars in two weeks. It's crazy. Everybody wants to be like, oh man, like, but look at all the work y'all put in. It's like you can put a ton of work into a project and like raise a hundred bucks. People are used to seeing things like GDQ and whatnot, you know, really put together stuff, and they're like, oh well, obviously if you put a lot of work into it, you can raise a ton of money. But that's that's not a guarantee, especially not during Rona. Like literally, I told Saban a thousand dollars that that's that's the goal and he's like now nah, we're gonna raise like 4k and i'm like we're gonna we're gonna 1k is fine let's start let's start with 1k and if i'm wrong i'm wrong and so to raise ten thousand dollars is like still kind of like blows my mind trans lifeline is a peer-to-peer -peer hotline run by trans people to support trans people i wouldn't be here if i didn't call trans lifeline one night like they're not a suicide hotline but they are a support line and when you're talking to someone else who's trans they understand the type of stuff you're going through like i wouldn't legally have my name changed if it wasn't for trans lifeline so to get to do something like transitional combat was I, I, like I, it's it's hard to like put into words because like you everybody likes to say like you know the fgc is great and diverse yada 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 blah 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 but like we know better right like so to, like have people be so excited to sign up to have people be stoked just to donate money right like that whole experience is just so overwhelming for me right it's just like it's hard i'm usually very good at this word thing and, and talking right that's why people pay me to do it but it, it really is difficult to like put into words what it feels like to have a tweet go to a $10,200 raising event. It's just not a thing that like I can fully process. With over $10,000 raised for Trans Lifeline, Transitional Combat was a success. However, in the following days, there was a lack of coverage both within and outside the community about the event, while other charity initiatives were being reported on. When asked why, Amanda attributed it to the constant fight for visibility in the FGC. Logan and F-Word have the show on Thursdays, right, for Capcom. So Logan was like, yo, I want to talk about transitional combat. And it's real funny to me, like, the altered headspace of like, oh shit, there's the coolness of like being on the official, an official Capcom show. And then like, watching people have to get nuked out of chat during my segment. If people ever want to know, like what I said to people, when people were constantly asking me, you know, what's it like being trans in the FGC? What's it like being trans in the FGC? It's like, you could do the coolest thing possible, right? Like my tournament raised some of the highest amount of money that any other FGC tournament has raised for charity in the past couple months. But then I can get clowned for being trans. Here's a better one. Problem X, one Evo, hype moment for the UK. It's the only person I interviewed Problem X after he won that day. We got that shit up hyper quick retweeted it you know he retweeted it mouse esports retweeted it a video only has like 400 views score esports did an interview with his ass two months later 5k views the day it was released and that's not to say like score has more subscribers yada 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 but like it makes you think sometimes so alex myers i respect him a lot because like puts himself through a lot to, to be a good content creator when he was trying to get his YouTube together, he made a Reddit post on r slash Street Fighter of like, what do you guys want in your Street Fighter YouTube content? I made a thread when I was launching the neutral last year, where I was like, hey, I've been making content in the FGC for the past three, four years. I really want to give you guys like a cool show. What do you guys want out of the show? And while yes, I got some really great suggestions, but then like there's a guy that's like, like, oh man, I have something to say, but I won't say it. And I'm like, all right, say it, say it, come on. And then he's gotta talk about like my transits. And it's like, my dude, you're calling me fat. Cool, I already know that. Like, I, mirrors exist. 
Whenever people call me fat, I'm like, what do you think? Do you think I think I'm skinny? Do you think at 282 pounds, I think I'm like, you know, lightweight, like I'm like I'm link size and smash? No, I know I'm Bowser tier, okay? Like it's this weird dichotomy where people are like, oh man, you do all these cool things, you know, you do Red Bull Conquest, you do Evo, you do this, you do that. And it's like, cool, I can show you every single time I post about one of those things, somebody trying to clown me for being trans. Like, it's just, it's just like this weird, it's this weird experience. And I'm not gonna say that like white folks don't have this problem or like cis people, they don't have this problem, but it's just mad funny to me that like nobody wanted to talk about transitional combat until like I got super loud about the fact that nobody was talking about transitional combat. But it's like no event hubs, no top tier, no, no shuriken. No Polygon, no Kotaku. So it's like crazy to me. It's like, well, what, what, what more did transitional combat need to do? Raise 10K in two weeks. And that's what it feels like to be like a black female or a black trans person or a trans person in the FGC. And this is not to say that nobody gets shit, right? Like it's not like only trans people, non-binary people, queer people get shit. But it's just really funny how somebody writes a whole article about Black Lives Matter in the FGC and there's not a single female voice. Sharpie literally put Skullgirls on her back day in and day out. No mention. June Bay, she does amazing shit for Equinox. Nothing. Like, it doesn't even have to be about me. Like, if y'all don't like me, cool. Whatever. Fuck it. I don't give a shit. I'll still be here. It just baffles me. It's, it's insane to me that time and time and again, queer and female people in the FGC seem to always have to like go to bat for ourselves. And once we do, obviously everybody comes out the woodwork. Oh yeah, we support combo queens. Oh yeah, we support Cuddlecore. Oh yeah, we love Sharpie. Oh yeah, we love Romanova. Oh man, Sherry Genix, you know, she she's a road warrior, right? As soon as like we start talking about it, everybody's like, oh yeah, all of y'all ladies are dope. But like, why do we always have to talk about it? There's a preconceived notion that all are equal in the fighting game community. And while it is more diverse than most other gaming spaces, it still has its issues with visibility. And with the slew of sexual abuse allegations over the past few months, it is clear that the community has to do better and have the difficult conversations needed to move forward. What can the FGC do at the moment to pave a better future for itself? So like one of the things that I, I talk about a lot when it comes to like improving the spaces that you're in, don't just wait for a Me Too movement to be like, yo, but like, here are some like dope people, right? Like, or, you know, one of the things that I and some other people have said, recognize these people year round, right? You know, it's the thing that I tell a lot of esports orgs. It's cool that you want to do shit in June, but like gay people, like we're around year round. It's not like Groundhog's Day, right? We don't like pop out of our bur burrow in June and our like leather straps and like go-go shorts and flags being like, woo, woo. And then like June ends, like July 1st comes and we're like, yo, scram, it's the straights. And like, we go back in our borough. No, like we're around year round. Like black people exist year round. Shockingly, I know. I think one of the problems I see a lot with the FGC is that some of the smaller community projects don't get enough visibility. And it's those smaller community projects that really are the, people highlighting these these communities year round, right? You know, I'm giving top tier shit, but top tier is like one of the few things that like actually talks about like, you know, they do the unsung hero, right? And that tends to be a lot of minority people and women, right? But like, we don't talk about top tier, right? When we, when we talk about FGC media, we talk about Event Hub, Suryukin, Kotaku, right? Why aren't we talking about top tier, right? So like, that's, my thing is that like, it's not that there aren't people putting in the business and highlighting, you know, various types of people is that it feels like the FGC just doesn't always care. And it's like the, the right people do, right? Like you've heard of the unsung hero, but there seems to be like a disconnect from like the broader FGC. And if you, if, if you want a solution to that, man, if I figured that out, the neutral would have like 20 K viewers every every monday on twitch right so like i definitely don't have like a solution but i'm really impressed 
that, you know, there's a bunch of TOs right now working to make some form of universally accepted code of conduct. They have a Discord put together that I'm in that I really got to spend more time in because I, I have a lot of experience, especially from working in the magic community, um, building code of conducts. As much as I love TOs, I'm not going to say no TO has a lot of experience building a code of conduct, but I don't think that they have the nuance that may be needed to tackle a lot of different things. Um, and while yes, the Discord has a, a sheer volume of lived experiences, lived experiences isn't the only thing you need in order to build something like that. You need people who are trained in those spaces in order to you know handle those things correctly. So I think the FGC is on the right path. I think in a snapshot, that is 2020. I think the digital era of the FGC is what will allow us to do more and be better because we are more aware, I think, of our of our actual global community as opposed to, you know, what's going on in Street Fighter and what's going on in Tekken, right? Where I think we're more aware of, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff. A healthy relationship starts with communication. And so if we're not having this really difficult talk, we cannot get better. And you know what? It, it, no one wants to hear we don't treat Black women the same way we treat other people in the FGC. Nobody wants to hear that, right? We don't want to talk about how women experience after parties differently than guys do. We don't want to talk about that. Right. We always try to say, well, oh, you know, I just want to push buttons. Right. Like, I just want to press buttons. But that's not the only thing that happens at a fighting game event. Nobody just goes, plays their matches, like sits down in a chair afterwards and then waits for their next match. That's not how an FGC event works. And it's never worked that way. Right. It's always been a culture of experiencing other people. And so this idea, right, this rose tinted glass of like, well, oh, back in the day, fighting game events were just people getting together and pushing buttons, right? I'm not an old head, right? You know, I was never around for the arcade days, but I'm going to make a not lofty assumption that you didn't just go to an arcade, push buttons, and then go home when you ran out of quarters. You sat around and you talked to people and then maybe y'all went and got food. And then maybe when y'all were older, you went and got drinks. So let's not pretend that all we need at our fighting game events is people pressing buttons and like, you know, that's it. That's not how communities work. Being a community means that things are gonna get difficult. And that like, if you want it to be a community, guess what, communities hurt. You can't have fighting games without not wanting to be around other folks. The thing about putting people in close proximity is that if you're going to do that, you have to have rules. And so that's why I think things will get better because we want to be able to go to events and have those moments. There's no way that that comes back without getting through this. And it's it's whether or not we go forwards quick enough that we don't leave good people behind. Thanks for watching our chat with Amanda Stevens on transitional combat. Our work is made possible by our patrons like these guys. If you like what you saw and want to help us make more, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash holdbacktheblog. Until next time.